guys, welcome back to chapel. It's amazing to have you with us. We are so excited. Can you believe that summer just disappeared, didn't it? The hottest summer since the 1980s. It was, it was insane. Uh, I got burnt on the first day um, of the summer in 2018. Um, I had blisters all over my arms. Um, I had a massive one here. Um, my wife Ruth was calling it my second bicep. Um, it was actually just my first bicep, but I'll take what I can get. Um, but what a cracking summer, yeah? Uh, but it's great to be back, and I believe that God wants to do a new thing in Dublin. Um, I believe the new thing is the same thing, and the same thing is that God just wants to touch every single life in Dublin City. Amen? There's, there's, there's no new thing. It's, it's the same thing. It's the Spirit of God. It's the presence of God. It's, it's Jesus touching the lives of, of young people um, across the capital city. Um, and we're just so excited as a team, as chapel, as a community here that you would join us this evening. If it's your first time, you are so welcome. Um, welcome home. As it says over there, you belong here. You truly do. Uh, no matter what your background is, no matter what you came in here with, um, this is a place where you can meet Jesus and this is a place where you can meet real community. Amen. Amen. So we were thinking as a team a while back about how we would approach um, the first few months of chapel, obviously getting back into the swing of things. Um, and, and we were kind of just praying about it. And we met a while back and uh, we really felt as a team that there was one specific thing that needed to be addressed in our generation. And this specific thing is the whole area of fear and anxiety. Hmm. Yeah, it's just a communal mm, across the room. Fear and anxiety is probably the biggest killer in our age. It's the killer of joy. It's the killer of hope. It's the killer of future. It's the killer of potential. And we really feel, and it's going to be our focus this year in chapel, even the card on your seat, you probably noticed, more love, less fear. And we believe that when you give your life to Jesus, you experience more love, love, abounding love, and less fear. And really, I wanted to kick off this week with a message focused specifically on what to do when fear strikes. Because the reality is for every single one of us, all 250 people in this room tonight, is that fear will strike. I don't know if you've, if you've experienced anxiety before. I don't know if you've experienced some kind of fear before. But I believe that it is something that is common to everyone in this room. I think it's a common thread, a common uh, situation or emotion or feeling that would tie us all together. Because we all know what it feels like. And it's so funny because our, our fears can go from super trivial to super, super deep. So super trivial is like my fear of having a shaved head like Mark McCann over there. He's not actually bald yet, although it may not grow back. Mark shaved his head there last week and I don't know, thumb up, thumb down. It's, it's hard to know. The verdict is still out. Oh, plenty of thumbs up. Okay. They're obviously on your payroll, okay. But we have trivial fears like that. I know for me growing up, my second biggest fear as a child was leaving the house and being found with my dad wearing his socks and sandals. Anyone relate? I think it's another common fear across the room. Everyone's like, hmm. And it wasn't just any socks. It wasn't just like the nice kind of white, pristine uh, ankle socks. It was like the dirty, mustard, beige kind of socks that have been sitting in the back of the drawer, kind of moldy for the last six months since the weather was actually good. Um, and, and he'd rock them out and then he'd take out these dirty old sandals that had just been passed through generation and generation of our family. They're the same sandals Moses actually wore. If you're wondering, the exact same. I'm going to inherit them. Um, and that was my second biggest fear. But my biggest fear... And it's funny because it's actually coming back in fashion, so I don't know what to do about this. My biggest fear was leaving the house and being found with my mother wearing one of those, you know, the, what are they called? Fanny packs, the kind of bum bags. Fanny packs is an American phrase for all the Americans in the, in the crowd. There's probably no one, but there you go. The bum bags, which doesn't make any sense because it's in front of your bum. It's here and your bum is there. But anyway... That's a whole different night at chapel. We'll get into that. Well, actually, no, we'll never get into that. You can talk about that in your small groups. But she, she had this one and it was like fluorescent green, fluorescent pink. And it was just the most manky thing. And they were like the strangest couple with their socks and their sandals and their bum bags. And uh, 
I just think it's so funny that our fears can go from those really trivial things to the more deep, to the more deeply rooted ones, to the ones that plague us, the ones that keep us awake at night, the ones that haunt us as we're, we're getting the bus to work or the bus to college, the ones that play on our minds day after day after day, moment after moment after moment. And this, but this morning, I was going to say this afternoon, because it's definitely not the morning, it is evening. We are going to talk about what to do when fear strikes, what to do when that fear, when that anxiety strikes, because it will strike. And we believe that we have Elohim, we have God himself on our side. So when it does strike, we are able to stand against it. Amen. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. And we're just going to look at a couple of verses from 8 to 12. And it says this. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Now David was an amazing king in Israel. And underneath him in his army, he had three main men who he put over thousands of soldiers. These were bold, courageous, fearless men who had proven themselves in battle. And these are their names. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. The first is Josheb Bashabeth, a Tachmanite. I, I just love that. There's something strong about Tachmanite. It's, I don't know. I, I was just thinking, I was like, my firstborn, he's going to be called Tachmanite. There's just something bad about it, isn't there? Tachmanite. Josheb, a Tachmanite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Not the kind of lad you want to meet on a Friday night in Temple Bar. The Tachmanite. Then the Israelites, sorry, next was him to Eleazar, son of Dodai, the Ahabite. And I was reading this, I was, I was just thinking, Eleazar, I was like, oh, that's so strong. The son of Dodai, I'm like, you lost me. Eleazar is like, yeah. And then Dodai is like, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's, it's a little bit weak. Eleazar, the son of Dodai, the Ahalite, as one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at pass for battle. And then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day and the troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. And this third person is the person I really want to focus on tonight. Because his life offers examples of how to deal with fear when fear strikes. How to respond when fear strikes. Next to him was Shama, the son of Agi. Everyone say Shama, the son of Agi. Shama. We'll work on that. Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck down the Philistines. And the Lord brought about a great victory. And as I was reading this, I was, I was thinking to myself, what did Shammah do when fear struck his life? How did Shama respond when fear intimidated him? When, when his fear came, when his enemy came against him, how did he respond? And the first thing I noticed was this, when fear strikes, remind fear of your future. Remind fear of your future. You see, the thing about fear is this, fear happens in a moment in time, it happens in a situation, it happens in a circumstance, it happens in, in a moment, in a split second, in, in a person or something that happened in your past that made you fearful. So what happens is we get rejected. Someone doesn't want to be friends with us or they won't play with us in senior infants and we get a little bit annoyed and we're, we're going through secondary school and we're, we're still afraid that, that someone else is going to reject us. And as a result, we live out of that moment or that situation in our past and we carry it into our present and we live our future just like our present and our past. It happens in terms of failure. Something happens. We slip up. We make a mistake. We say something daft. We say something stupid. We look like a fool. And some moment happened in our past, but we carry it into our present and we are afraid that it will happen again and again and again and again. Or we invested so much in a relationship 
and it failed or something happened or someone let you down and you end up carrying that into your present and into your future because fear always operates and lives in the past. But it always carries itself into our present and into our future. But what Shama did is so, so interesting because Shama was the son of Agi. Now, as I was reading this, I was thinking, Aggie, what a strange name. Like, all these names are weird, but Aggie is just like, that's just bizarre. Like, come on. Like, did they not have something cooler back in the day than Aggie? They literally, they were the first ones to create names and they came up with Aggie. Now, if your name is Aggie in the room, I am so sorry. We would love you to be in a clan, in a small group. We would love you um, to serve on a team. Um, please don't leave. Um, but son of Aggie, I was thinking, what's this son of Aggie? Why would they even put that in there? But the name Aggie, who was Shama's father, means one who runs away. It means one who is fearful. It means one who at the sight of fear or intimidation will disappear. It's one who when, when the enemy comes will turn the other way and will flee because of fear. So all that Shama ever knew from his past was that he was Shama the son of Agi. He was Shama, the son of one who runs away, the son of one who flees, the son of one who when fear comes, retreats. That was his past. So you can imagine Shama, he's going into school and they're like, oh, what's your name? He's like Shama, the son of Agi. And they're like, ooh, I don't know if you're going to be a loyal friend. You might just run away when I need you. Because he's the son of Agi. And that was his past. And his past became his present. And by extension, his present, his everyday became his future. And you see, Shama's story is our story. It's, it's your story. It's my story. I remember when I was 18, I took a year right after college and um, I, I decided to work down the country. And um, over the course of the year, I don't even know what happened, but I, I started to get into this whole kind of mindset of comparison. And what it led to was really deep-rooted insecurity in my life, specifically about speaking. Now, what this meant was that I was living in a house with four other people. I'd get up in the morning, and naturally, I'm a very extroverted, energetic individual. But what actually started to happen was I'd get up in the morning, I'd walk into the kitchen, and my housemate would say hi, and I wouldn't even be able to communicate two words such as good morning. Such was the level of fear in my life. Such was the insecurity in my life. And what happened was it happened in a moment. It happened in a situation in my past where it was a a moment of hurt and I carried it into my present. And I lived out of that day after day after day after day. But eventually, we have to come to the point where we say, yes, fear happened in my past, but fear will not define my future. And that's exactly what happened with Shama. You see, even though Shama was the son of Agi, And even though you might be the son of Mary or you might be the son of John or you might be the son of Aggie, hopefully not, hopefully your mum's name isn't Aggie. Above that, you are actually a son of God. You are actually a child of God. You are actually a daughter of the King. And you have to remind fear that no matter what happened in your past, no matter what your background was, no matter what your fear was, no matter that moment that crippled you, you get to remind fear of your future. In Psalm 27, King David is on the run. He's the king elect. He's meant to be on the throne, but people have hunted him down. And the king is sitting in a cave. And he's sitting in a cave and he's he's writing poetry to the Lord. And he starts to write, The Lord is my light and my salvation. I will not be afraid. Even though he's being pursued by thousands of enemies. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I will not be afraid. And then he says this at the end of Psalm 27. He says, I would have lost hope. I would have lost hope had I not believed that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I believe that's a word, not just for me, but for you, but for all of Chapel, for all of Dublin City, that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Because our past will say that will never happen. Our past will tie us to our fear. But we will say, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And this is exactly what Aggie did. He wasn't crippled by his past. 
He said, you know what? I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living because when fear strikes, remind fear of your future. I have a future in God. You have a future in God. God has a purpose for your life. He has dreams and plans and ambitions for your life that he wants to bring to pass. But fear will say, you do not have a future. You just have a past. But the Lord says, remind fear of your future in me because I will bring it to pass. Amen. When fear strikes, remind fear of your future. The second thing is this. When fear strikes, remind fear of your field. When fear strikes, remind fear of your field. You see, Shammah was standing in a lentil field. Hands up, who likes lentils? I was not expecting that. I crafted a joke based upon 1% liking lentils. If you're sitting beside people who like lentils, beware, it is a very gassy bean. Lentils are the kind of thing that your mom puts in the soup when she's forgot to do the shopping and she only has enough to feed, I don't know, a three-year-old child. And she's like, oh, you know, it'll be fine. We'll put in a bag of lentils. And everyone's like, oh, no. And the lentil soup lasts the entirety of the week. Lunch, breakfast, dinner, brunch, with a little bit of smashed avo on top of the lentils. Lentils, who likes lentils? Apparently a few. But I I was reading this and I was thinking, he was standing in a lentil field. That is such an insignificant place to stand. Lentils are, you know, they, they seem like such an insignificant thing. But here is a man standing in a lentil field and defending it against his enemy. But the thing about lentils is that lentils back in this day were actually the main source of food. They were the main source of provision for the Israelites. Which meant that if the lentils were wiped out, the nation was wiped out. Which means that if the lentils went, everybody went. So Shammah is not just standing in a field. Like if if we looked at this, we think, oh, if he was standing in a field of gold or a field that, you know, had like something cool or it had a donut wall at the back of the field. I don't even know. If it it had something cool like, like that at the back of the field, you'd be like, that's pretty good, creative team. Well done. You know, but it was a field of lentils. But it was significant because it was his field of lentils. And there are certain things that the enemy will come along and he will say, don't mind that. Give in to fear in that area or in that field of your life because it's just a field of lentils. It's just an insignificant field that doesn't really mean that much. But the reality is this. If the enemy takes your lentil field, he'll take the next person's lentil field. He won't stop at your parents' field. He won't stop at your, your brother's field or your friend's field or your college mate's field. He will keep going field after field after field. When fear strikes, remind fear of your field. Now, the interesting thing about Shammah is this. You can picture the scene. The army's coming down the hill. They're they're coming down quick. And everyone is running away. Everyone in the field is going the other way. But Shammah is standing in the field. And as I was thinking about this, I was like, why is Shammah standing in the field? And some would say that Shammah stood in the field because it was his field. He was actually a farmer. This was Shammah's field that at 6 a.m. in the morning, he'd rise up and he'd go out to his field and he'd start planting some seed in his field and he'd go home later that night and he'd go to sleep and he'd watch a bit of Netflix or whatever they watched back in that day. And then he'd come out on the Tuesday morning and he'd plant some more seed, lentil seed in his field and he'd go home and he'd do it all again and he'd come back on the Wednesday and he'd plant some more field and then he'd take Thursday off because he needed a day off and then he'd come back out on the Friday and he'd plant some more seed. This was Shammah's field. And then the following week he'd come out and he'd water the seed. He'd sweat over the seed. He'd tear up over the weight and the burden of looking after this field of lentils. This was his field that he had invested his time, his energy everything that he had into growing this field. And there's certain areas I really feel that the Lord, that the Lord has equipped you to grow and the enemy is coming against it 
but it's something that you have plowed away at for years. It's, it's an individual or a friend that just doesn't seem to be coming around, but you're still plowing away at that field. Or it's, it's, it's something in your job or something in college that you feel like it, it just never will happen. And the enemy just wants to come against you with fear, but it's something that you faithfully plowed and it's something that you've faithfully given yourself to because it's your field. And this was Shammah's field. And you can picture the scene. The army's coming down the hill and uh, they all look like Mark McCann with the bald head, very intimidating. And uh, Shammah's there in the field and Shammah's literally the only one in the field because everyone is like, get away, the Philistines are coming, the enemy's coming, let's go. And they all start running away, but Shammah stands. Shammah stands in the face of logic because logic would say, get out of there, Shammah, you're an idiot. His emotions were saying, this is such a fearful situation. Get out of here, flee. His family history was saying, you're Shammah, the son of Agi, the son of one who runs away. You should just run away too, just like your dad ran away. He's standing in the face of culture. Culture is going that way and saying, be afraid, be anxious, get away, keep running, keep running. But somehow Shammah stands in the face of culture and he stands in the face of emotion. He stands in the face of logic and he stands in the face of his own past. And I don't know if Shammah stood because he was bold and he was brave or if Shammah stood because he was so afraid that he could not move. You ever get that? You're just like, no, I'm not afraid. It's just like, yeah, man, your, your knees are shit. No, 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 no. You know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you smell afraid. You know, lentils. You'll get that in a minute. But we don't know whether Shammah was standing there out of boldness or if he was standing there out of fear. But what we do know is that Shammah stood. And what we do know is that it actually doesn't matter if you stand in your fearful situation because you have the strength and the courage and the faith in God to do it or whether you're standing there because you're frozen to the spot and you can't move. All that matters is not that you stand, but who stands with you. And who stands with you in your field is Elohim. It is the Lord of all. It is Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit. Because when it's your field, and when you take a stand in your field, and you don't surrender to the enemy, you actually surrender to God. And when you surrender to God, it does not matter if you have no strength left. It does not matter if you're at the end of your tether or at the end of yourself. All that matters is that you're standing, and you're not standing in your own strength. You're standing in the strength of Jesus Christ. Because when fear strikes, remind fear of your field. You know, fear would say, sit down. My fear in my life would say, get off the stage. Sit down. Stop talking. No one's listening. This isn't going to make an impact. But when fear says, sit down, you should actually stand up. And when fear says, don't have that conversation, shut up, that's actually the time to speak up. And when fear says, you should run, that's actually the time that you should remain and you should fight. And when fear says flee, that is the moment that you should fight. My final point is this. When fear strikes, remind fear of your father. As the worship team come up. When fear strikes, remind fear of your father. You see, pop psychology, this, this world is full of pop psychology and I've, I've no real problem with it. Part of it can be good. My sister is um, a consultant psychiatrist and I was asking her about this whole thing of anxiety and I was telling her I was going to be speaking on it and she was saying anxiety is the most widespread mental illness, actually illness in general, she said, across our land. It's more common than almost the common cold. It's more common 
than, than anything else that you could put on the table. As I began at the beginning, it's the one thing that we have in common. And pop psychology would say, try a little harder. Wouldn't it? Pop psychology would say, do a little bit more, try a little bit harder. You know, you know, you can do it. You have the strength within you to do it. And pop psychology would put it all on me and it would put it all on you and it would say, you have the strength in and of yourself to do it. But who knows that we are weak individuals? Who knows that, that we do not have the ability or the strength to fight off the enemy when he comes to our lentil field? Pop psychology will only get us so far. And it it lies all on you. It lies all on your ability. It lies all on your strength and your effort and your ability to do it. And I'm going to try harder. And you try harder and you still can't defeat your fear and you still can't defeat your anxiety. And you try a little bit harder and you try a little bit harder, but still it doesn't seem to break. And still you find yourself running away from the lentil field when the enemy comes to attack what is your field. What is your mind? What is your heart? What is your family? What is yours? He has come to attack. What is yours? And you find yourself running away time after time after time again because pop psychology puts it all on you. Because when fear strikes, I don't want to remind fear of my pop psychology or of my own strength. I want to remind fear of my father. I remember I was on a, the under nines football team, the glory days. And uh, there was this kid on the opposite team. You know the way when you're growing up, there's always a kid in under nines who's like 20. He has, he has like a beard and he's been through puberty four times. And he has like 10 kids and he's on his second marriage. You know that kid? It's just like, yeah, right, you're nine. Come on, mature student, you know? Well, anyway, this bearded child starts to attack me on the pitch. And I remember I was like, oh, I don't know what to do. I was like shamming my knees and rattling together. And uh, I remember my dad, who was the coach in our team, came onto the pitch. And I remember he was like, don't you dare touch him. Now, my dad was bricking it. Honestly, I'm telling you, I could see a few lentils just dropping, you know? But when fear strikes, remind fear of your father. Because pop psychology will only get us so far. And we are prone to weakness. And as we close, I just want to close with a couple of really short thoughts. In the Bible, there's numerous names. Actually, let's do this. Let's stand. In the Bible, there's numerous names for God one is Jehovah Jireh Jehovah Jireh means God my provider there's Jehovah Nisi which means God my shepherd there's Jehovah Ra sorry Jehovah Nisi which means the Lord my banner Jehovah Ra which means the Lord my shepherd Jehovah Shalom which means the Lord is my peace But there's one more name for God in the Bible. And it's called Jehovah Shammah. It's spelt the exact same way, Jehovah Shammah. Do you want to know what Jehovah Shammah means? Jehovah Shammah means God is there. Jehovah Shammah means that God is there. Jehovah Shammah means that when you get up in the morning at 7 a.m. and the anxiety is turning within you, and believe me, I know what that feels like, you get to say Jehovah Shammah. When you feel like you're going to get rejected in college or rejected in your job, you get to go in there with confidence that is not of yourself, and you go Jehovah Shammah. My God is there. When you're reaching out to someone and and you're afraid of getting rejected or you're afraid that the friendship or the relationship won't work out, you get to go, you know what? Jehovah Shammah. 
When you're afraid to open your mouth and speak because the enemy has come against you with lies, you get to boldly declare, Jehovah Shammah, my God is here. My God is here. Jehovah Shammah, my God is here. God is here. I just want to close with this. A friend of mine lived in the country where the woods abounded with wild deer. One morning as he walked across his field, he heard the sound of hounds, of dogs in the distance. And as they approached, he saw a young fawn, a young deer, wearied with its tongue hanging out. The little deer had just enough strength to hurdle the fence and stood there for a moment, gazing in a frightened manner. When all of a sudden the deer saw a hound leap over the fence and its first impulse seemed to be to run away. But instead, it ran and fell down at the feet of my friend. And he said, my friend said, I stood there and I fought the dogs for nearly half an hour. I just felt that all the dogs in that country could not, should not, and would not capture the fawn after its weakness had appealed to my strength. After its weakness appealed to my strength, And you know what, maybe you're here tonight, you know, we're going to have a prayer team up here. Maybe you're here tonight and you feel like that deer. You feel like that one that's just been running, running, running and your tongue is hanging out and you're wearied. And the enemy has been coming at your mind and stirring your stomach with anxiety and fear. And we think that we have to do it in our own strength. But really, all we need to do is come and appeal to the strength of our Father. All we have to do is come and like the fawn, just say, you know what, I'm weak. I can't do it. I don't have the ability. I don't have the words. I don't have the confidence. I don't have the boldness. I don't have the courage. I don't know what to do, Jesus. But all I can do is appeal to your strength. And you know what the Lord says? Amen. I can deal with that. I'll take your weakness and I will turn your weakness into the greatest strength. Because when fear strikes, remind fear of your father. Amen. Come on, when fear strikes, let's say it together. When fear strikes, remind fear of your father. Come on, let's say it again. When fear strikes, remind fear of your father. One last time. When fear strikes, remind fear of your father. Amen. Let's worship together.